And I'm going to get you to turn to Luke chapter 6. In our morning services, we've been working our way through, uh, through Luke's gospel. And uh, we, come to, we come to a couple of stories uh, where Jesus is asked a question about uh, his and his disciples' Sabbath observance. Uh, and then there is another story where Jesus heals, where he gets to elaborate on and show what it is that he's, what it is that he's saying about the Sabbath. So uh, we're going to read Luke chapter 6 and the first 11 verses. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? to save life or to destroy it. And after looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, open up your word to us, we pray this morning. Holy Spirit, teach us truly what it is to rest from our labors and to rest in you. Lord, help us to, help us to hear the words of Jesus and let them sink into our hearts. We pray that you will bless us and teach us truly from your word this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's, uh, let's set the stage a little bit for, uh, for what happens in this story and for what, for what Jesus says to, uh, to the Pharisees and to the other people who are upset with him. So it's a Sabbath day, which from the creation of the world was the, was the, the, the seventh day of the week, okay? The day that we call Saturday, the, the seventh day of the week, because God created over the course of six days, and then on the seventh day, he rested. And so, uh, and so God created a pattern for us in his creative work that we ought to work for six and rest for one, that there ought to be a built-in pattern of work and rest in our lives, and that there ought to be a rhythm of work and rest in our lives, that we need to rest from our work as he rested from his on the seventh day, okay? So it's the Sabbath day, it's Saturday, and Jesus and his disciples are walking through a grain field, and, and his disciples are hungry. So, um, so they, they, uh, they, they pick some of the grain, uh, and then they eat it. And there are some Pharisees walking with them, and they say, Jesus, why do you let your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Why are you why are you so lax with your disciples when we know that they ought not do what they're doing right now? What's the Pharisees' problem with what Jesus' disciples are doing? What's their concern? Okay? Uh, I, I, want us, I want us to see a couple, a couple of things from the Old Testament law. The first, the first is for us simply to see that the problem is not that the disciples are stealing because they're not. Okay? And I can see how we would get that idea in our heads just from reading the story. They're walking through someone else's field. They take some of the crop that belongs to someone else and they eat it for themselves. That's stealing. That's what the problem is here. 
but it's actually not. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 25 says this, If you go into your neighbor's, sta- into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Okay? This is in the law, and there's this understanding that there is this shared responsibility among all of the Israelites to take care of each other's needs. And so if you're walking through someone else's field and you're hungry, you're allowed to just pick enough ears of grain to satisfy your hunger. You can't harvest their field and make it your own, but you can pick a few ears of grain to eat, okay? So they're not stealing. Let's just get that out of the way uh, from the start. However, however, ordinary work was forbidden on the Sabbath day. Uh, Turn quickly to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, uh, chapter 34 and verse 21. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. Okay? So this is the concern of the Pharisees that even though what the disciples is doing isn't stealing, they consider it work. Okay? So they're doing something that they ought not do. The Pharisees, in the Pharisees' mind anyway, they are working on the Sabbath day. So Jesus and the Pharisees end up having an argument over whether he should rebuke his disciples for eating the grain to satisfy their hum- hunger uh, or, or whether he shouldn't. And Jesus appeals to three different things in answering them. Uh, he appeals to three different things. So let's, let's, let's talk about this. First, let's talk about the Sabbath and need, the Sabbath and human need. Read again verses 1 through 4 of chapter 6. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to them. Okay. Jesus makes an appeal to an Old Testament story, a story about David and his men eating the bread of the presence. Um, And uh, this is a story that comes from 1 Samuel, uh, from 1 Samuel 21. Let's just, very quickly, let's read it. 1 Samuel 21 uh, and the first six verses. First Samuel 21, 1 Samuel 21, 1-6. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women, and David answered the priest, truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Okay. All right. So what's going on in this story is that David's running away from King Saul. Okay, Saul wants to kill him, and David and his, and his army, his small army of men that are faithful to him, are on the run from King Saul who's hunting him. And so, and so they're in need. They don't have any supplies. They have been going for some time. They're hungry. Some of his men perhaps are near starvation. And so they're running from King Saul, and they come to the tabernacle, and they're, they're talking to the priest, and David asks him if he has any bread that they can eat. And the priest only has the bread of the presence. This is a particular bread that was replaced every day, that was there, that was 
uh, that was part of various sacrifices and offerings to the Lord. And it was the, the bread was placed outside the most holy place, and it was replaced with new bread every Sabbath day. And the old bread was to be eaten only by the high priest and the other priests serving with him. That's from Leviticus 24. And yet, because of their great need, because the men needed to eat, Ahimelech gives the bread to David and his men, even though technically it wasn't lawful for them to eat it. There was a recognition that their need superseded the, 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 the purity requirements of the bread, okay? The, the laws that had been put there for its use in the ceremonial system was overridden by the men's need. So why does Jesus, why does Jesus use this story in his refuting of the Pharisees? What's the connection between the two of them? Jesus and his, and his disciples weren't being chased. They weren't on the run. They weren't starving and near death. But in both cases, some men were doing something which was not technically lawful, yet neither one was displeasing to God. Why? Because God loves those made in his image, and he is pleased for their needs to be met and for them to be refreshed and nourished. Jesus' disciples were hungry on the Sabbath, and so it was good for them to eat. And if they need to pick a few ears of grain for them to eat, so be it. Harvesting as work was forbidden on the Sabbath, but Jesus and his disciples are hungry. And so picking heads of grain to eat is fine because they're meeting their need. They're eating when they're hungry. The Pharisees say they're working. But Jesus says they're hungry. They're getting what they need to live. Okay? And so Jesus is, is recognizing something deeper, something more fundamental than what the Pharisees saw. We're going to talk about this in just a minute. But the Pharisees' understanding of obedience and the law had become focused on the law itself. The law was there in order for them to follow it, and they were so afraid of transgressing it at any point that they would make rules that would, that would bring them farther and farther and farther away from it so that there would be no risk that they would ever get anywhere near breaking the law. Only now they have this tradition that has brought them back that is forbidding them to do things that, that you're actually permitted to do, things that are actually pleasing to God. Their focus was on the law. The law is there for us to keep it. We are meant to, we are meant to, to serve it. Okay? And Jesus is focused on something much more fundamental, that the Sabbath in particular is given for our good, not us for its good. That the Sabbath is given to us for our rest, for us to meet our needs for something that is good and restorative and nourishing for us, okay? So let's, let's, let's move on. So we talked about the Sabbath and need. Let's talk about the Sabbath and its purpose, which I just kind of sort of started to get into right there. But let's pick up the story at verse 6. We're going to read 6 through 10. On another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. Okay. So having said these things about the Sabbath on a different Sabbath day, there's now a subsequent Sabbath where Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, and this man is there who has a, who has a withered hand, probably some sort of birth defect that he's had, that he's had his entire life. And there are more Pharisees there on this day, and they're watching Jesus, not so they can worship the Lord, not so that they can learn more about him, 
not so that they can grow in their own faith. They're watching Jesus to try to find something that they can trap him in. And what they're really hoping is that Jesus is going to heal this guy so that they can accuse him, so that they have something against him. The Pharisees' primary concern, as I mentioned before, is to go nowhere near breaking the law. So they had invented an entire system of rules about acceptable Sabbath practice. They had regulations on how far you could walk on the Sabbath and, and things like that. Their fundamental orientation was to put rule upon rule in order for, to protect the law. The goal was to preserve and protect the law. And then they wanted the people to serve those rules. They made the Sabbath a burden on people in order to protect the law. They were so devoted to protecting it that they would rather see, understand what's happening in this story, they would rather see disabled or deformed people remain that way than to see them healed on the Sabbath. Okay. Jesus argues that it is always lawful to do good, even on the Sabbath that it is always lawful to preserve life and heal, even on the Sabbath. Essentially, Jesus is making the same argument in a roundabout way that he makes in other Gospels, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That the Sabbath is here for our good. It's meant to be an institution of God that serves our needs, that serves our good, rather than something that is here simply to be a burden on us. In other words, the Sabbath is supposed to be for your good. It's supposed to provide a built-in rhythm of work and rest in your life. It's meant for your spiritual and your physical well-being. The Sabbath wasn't created by God for there to be a bunch of arbitrary laws for you to follow. You weren't, you weren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for you, for you to rest from your ordinary labors and catch your breath for you to rest in Christ and hear the gospel. And this saying of Jesus, this example of Jesus, ought to orient the way that we think about our own Lord's Day practice. So from the creation of the world up until, up until Jesus, the Sabbath day was always the seventh day of the week, what we call Saturday. It was the day where the Lord completed His work of creation and rested from his own work. And we start to get hints in the New Testament of, of an understanding that the, the first day of the week, the day that we call Sunday, started to take on a special significance for the, for the Christian community. In Revelation, we have, uh, we, have, we have a discussion of the Lord's Day, the first time we see that phrase. And early on, the Christians began to see a special, a special significance to Sunday to the first day to the day where the Lord completed his work of recreation because it's the day that following the resu following the crucifixion of Jesus that Jesus rose from the dead the day where sin is defeated the day where death is defeated the day where the new creative work of God through Christ begins and so for for centuries Christians have seen, have seen some carryover from the Sabbath observance of the Old Covenant into the need for continued Sabbath observance for us in the New. And I'm saying Jesus ought to orient the way that we think about our own practice when it comes to, when it comes to this for us. Because... Whenever this subject comes up, the questions I always get, and typically what people always want to hear about, are the rules, right? The laws. Just lay down the new law for us, tell us what we can do and what we can't do, and especially tell other people what they can't do. And that's what we want out of this discussion. Can I do this? What about that? And I worry that our, that our fundamental orientation in approaching the Sabbath is sometimes more akin to that of the Pharisees than to that of Jesus. Don't tell me what the Sabbath is for. Just tell me the rules I need to follow. Lay them down for me. Give me the new law. That's what I want. The Pharisees ask, 
How can we make sure we never break the law? How can we protect the law from us? And Jesus asks, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? The Sabbath was made for you. It is rooted in the creative activity of God for six days and then resting on the seventh. It is made for your good. And with the way we've structured our lives, always being on the go, never stopping, always working, even when we're at home. And by the way, there have been, there have been advances in technology and in practice over the last number of years that are meant to make our lives a lot simpler and easier. But the net effect of them often is that it just means that we're expected to be at work all the time, right? Uh, over the last couple of years, it's become a very common thing for people to work at home who didn't normally do that before. And there's nothing inherently wrong with working at home. I'm not trying to discourage it for anyone who does that. But also recognize that along with that comes greater and greater, uh, or at least it's easy for there to be greater and greater blurring of work and life outside of work, of work and rest. And it tends to it tends to insert itself in more and more places in parts of our lives that used to be free from it. We have cell phones now. Each and every person has one that connects us not only to phone calls, but to the internet and to our email and to text messaging in ways that 20, 20, only 20 years ago, which I can remember, was unthinkable. And so the expectation now is that you are available to take calls and respond to emails, and it's a, like at all hours of the day. Maybe not between 12 and 6 a.m., but other than that, it's expected all the time, right? And so our work has this tendency to creep more and more into our lives, to take up more and more headspace and more and more of our time and energy. And it gets to the point where we convince ourselves that we simply just don't have time to rest, which usually isn't true. We find time for the things that we want. We find time for the things that we need. And when Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, it ought to convince us that we need it. This is something we need. It's something that's actually good for us. It ought to register in our hearts. It ought to register in our heads that we need to rest. That there needs to be time for each one of us where we are not on the clock or on call. We need a day set apart to set aside our ordinary labors and to worship the Lord. We need it not, not, not for the sake of, not simply for the sake of obeying the law, as if it's there just for us to serve it, but recognizing that we are finite, weak creatures. We only have so much energy. We only have so much time. We can only spend so much of our existence sleeping. And so we need, we need time for rest. We need a rhythm of work and rest in our lives. So I'm not going to hand out a list of the things that you may and may not do on Sundays. I'm convinced that we're missing the point when that's the takeaway from all of this. But let me ask you these questions. And I've asked things like them before. And you should consider them carefully. The Sabbath not being governed simply by a bunch of harsh rules doesn't mean that it's just like every other day or that it ought to be just like every other day for us. So let me give you these to consider, and I'll do them slowly because I've been told before that when I do things like this, I go too fast. So I'll do them relatively slowly. Do you have a rhythm of work and rest in your life? That need is built into the way our world was made. Have you convinced yourself that you don't need to rest? You do. Okay, we like to tell ourselves we like to be tough, we like to be industrious, and we'll say things like, you know, I can sleep when I'm dead and all that stuff. And you need, you need to rest. Okay, so the question is, where is the rhythm of work and rest in my life? Okay, second one. Is your Sunday practice merely about getting to church and then going back to your normal way of life for the rest of the day? Consider the significance, consider the, the, the truth 
that God has set aside an entire day for your good, that it's meant to be for your good. Third, the rest we need is both spiritual and physical. Jesus made it his habit to attend synagogue on the Sabbath. In attending corporate worship, we are reminded that we rest from our works in trying to, trying to earn God's love, and instead we rest in the perfect life of Christ and the love of God given to us through Him in the gospel, that He lived perfectly and died as a sacrifice for sinners like us. We are reminded of this every week, and we are invited again to rest in the work of Jesus for us. Does your practice include corporate worship and providing spiritual rest for your soul as, as a part of your rhythm of work and rest? And fourth, do you see the Sabbath as a set of rules to follow? And that's the goal. We just sort of check each one off the list and then we know we've done our Sabbath correctly. Or, or rather, see it as a gift that is much needed rest that God has built into the way his world works for your good, to serve your needs. Okay. There's no one correct way to order our, our, our practice on these things, but in general, in general, we should strive to find a day to rest from our ordinary labors and to gather with the church of God. We need to rest from our own works and trust in the finished work of Christ on our behalf. And the purpose of this isn't simply to obey some arbitrary rules, it's to have a healthy rhythm of work and rest in our lives. To the extent that you're able, it's good to, give, to also give rest to others on the Sabbath. Don't cause others to work on your behalf if, if you can avoid it. It's not just Christians who need a rhythm of work and rest. And remember, remember what Jesus says, that it is always lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. It is always lawful to provide for your own needs and life and for the needs and life of others. It's good for doctors and nurses and people who work for the electrical and water companies and police officers and paramedics and corrections officers and pastors to do their jobs on the Sabbath. It's good for the people ministering to the sick and dying to the homeless and others meeting basic needs to work as well. Structure your life to the extent that you're able into a rhythm of work and rest and worship and don't become so oriented toward the law of it all that you forget that it is always lawful to do good. Remember that the Sabbath is there for you. It's there to serve your need and to provide a way for you to receive the rest that you need. And the last thing is the Sabbath and its Lord. Verse 5. And Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Understand that what Jesus is saying here is pretty new to most of the people who were listening to him. It's not as if he was going against the Old Testament law. Instead, he was giving them a new way of understanding it, where their hearts had become so oriented towards serving the law as the goal and end that there was no way to see its goodness for us. So how can Jesus say all of this? How can he, how can he reorient centuries worth of, of religious thinking on, on this topic? How could he bless David and his men eating bread that was only to be eaten by the priests? How could he bless his disciples eating heads of grain when it could be possible to consider that as work on the Sabbath? How could he heal on the Sabbath when the authorities considered that work? Because what Jesus says here is, because Jesus gets to decide what the Sabbath is about. It's his. He made it. That's what he means when he says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He is its Lord. He made the world over the course of six days and then he rested. He made man in his image and gave the Sabbath to him as a gift for his rest, for his nourishment and for his refreshment. When the Sabbath is used for the good of man, it is glorifying and honoring to Jesus by refreshing those made in his image and honoring the purpose for which the thing was made in the first place. 
When men rest from their works and hear the gospel, they are honoring the Christ who purchased an eternal Sabbath rest for our bodies and our souls and who has given us but a taste of that rest in our rhythm of work and rest now. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and he made it for your good. And the Lord of the Sabbath rebukes the Pharisees for taking something meant for our good and turning it into a burdensome list of rules. And I've heard modern teaching on the Lord's Day do essentially the same thing. I've I've heard it taught that, that you should prepare your Sunday meals in advance so that you don't need to work on the Sabbath, which just puts you on the wrong side of the discussion between Jesus and the Pharisees on, in terms of his disciples eating grain. You understand it's the same thing. Now listen, if you want to do that so you can have more time to rest on, on your Sunday, by all means, go right ahead. But if you do that because you think simply feeding yourself or your family or your friends constitutes work and so is breaking the rules, this is one of the ways we end up more oriented toward the Pharisees' way of thinking than towards Jesus. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. It's his, it's for him, and he gives it to you for your good. Worship with his people, meet your needs, rest from your labors, be refreshed, find some rest, and worry a little less about what everyone else is or isn't doing. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, and he made it for you. Let's pray. Our Father... Today and every day, help us to rest from our own labors and rest in Jesus Christ, whose work of redemption is finished, who has done everything that needs to be done so that needy sinners like us might be forgiven of all of our sins, might have eternal life in your house. Help us to build into our lives a rhythm of work and rest that recognizes this, that we need it, that you have given us a day to do it, that it is for our good and help us always to remember that it is always lawful to do good, to love, to heal on the Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.